verse 1. First Samuel chapter number 16 and verse 1. And the Lord God Jehovah, capital L-O-R-D, covenant keeping God, said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint him unto me, whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. Watch this. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming. And said, Comest thou peaceably? Father, I pray now that you'd anoint this word tonight and anoint me to teach it, Father, and preach it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me say that as we get into the text tonight, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I believe from Genesis to Revelation is the inspired Scripture. I believe the Bible is without error. It is inerrant. I believe the Bible is God's Word speaking to us that it is ever living, ever alive. <laughs> what you're reading about here took place approximately 1,000 years before Christ. You're reading about something that happened 3,000 years ago. You might say to yourself tonight, how in the world could something that happened so far back in the past have any relevance for me today? But the fact of the matter is, it is the living Word of God. Being alive, the Word of God is quick and powerful. Being alive, it can speak to every single generation in their lifetime, where they live, their culture, their, their topography, their geography, wherever they live. It can speak to you as I pray that it does tonight. Samuel was the last of the, of the judges, but he's also the greatest of the prophets. In, uh, in that period of time. Samuel was called a seer and was also called a prophet. Samuel was set aside unlike anyone else that we read about in the Bible because Hannah brought him to the tabernacle. There he stayed and there he grew up. His name means Ask of God, Samuel. Samuel is a very, very popular name among Jewish people. A lot of men are called Samuel, but you'll see it as Shmolo when you see the Jewish name today. That's a reference to Samuel, ask of God. What's important to understand is that every Hebrew name practically has some sort of a meaning that either relates to a prophecy about their birth or an incident about their birth or the manner of their birth or something that has to do with them personally. Therefore, their name identifies them. So when the Hebrew would pronounce the name, he knew that there's something going on with this individual. So when they said Samuel, they knew someone had, had named him that because they asked of God. And of course, we know that Hannah did. Hannah asked the Lord for a child, and God gave her Samuel. And of course, she gave him back to the Lord. And there he stayed at Shiloh, and he was raised by the hand of God and the priest that was there. There was no doubt in anyone's mind from Dan to Beersheba, in other words, from the northernmost part of Israel, Dan, to Beersheba in the south, in the desert, there was no doubt in anyone's mind whatsoever that Samuel was a prophet of God, ordained of God. In plain words, he had absolute authority, and when men, when men, when men heard him speak, they listened. If you'll notice, when he walked into this village, the village, the men of the village shook. They, quiv they, they, they quivered. And the, the reason they did is because they knew that Samuel was there on a divine mission. And they didn't know what it was. They could have been that he came to judge them. That's why they said, are you here in peace? It could have been that he was there to do something that had to do with a sacrifice unto God, some high spiritual thing. 
What he did when he took the cow was subterfuge. It was to cover up what he intended to do for the Lord. Let me put this in here, in case you don't know this. In the book of Exodus, when the young men were born to the Hebrew women, the Hebrew women, the midwives, lied to Pharaoh about the birth of these sons. Because Pharaoh had already passed an order down that all the sons were to be killed. And so therefore, they rejected the authority of the state over the birth of their sons. They lied to them. And God used that to protect His people. Some of you act like you've never heard that in your life. Go back and read it. Go back and read it and pray over it. God used that to protect His people. When the Lord Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, He said, You render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. Caesar has a proclivity to want more and more and more and more. Caesar, if you don't stop him, will take your very children out of your house and take them away from you. This is why you have a democratic republic in this country. Democracy is all right to a point. I'll take the republic any day. A republic is a nation governed by law. The supreme law of this land is the Constitution of the United States of America. That Constitution gives you certain inalienable rights. Inalienable means that they are not, cannot be alienated from you. You cannot be separated from these rights except through a court of law. So Samuel means ask of God. Something big is about to happen. Something profound is going to happen to Israel. Samuel had been the sole spiritual authority over all the people for some time. They recognized the spiritual authority that Samuel had over all of Israel. But now they wanted a king. They wanted a king like all the other nations around them. This is their first mistake. Their first mistake is trying to be like the nations around them. They wanted to be accepted. They wanted to be part of the flow of humanity. Let me tell you something, folks. When the church loses its uniqueness, and the Lord Jesus Christ is what makes us unique, when we preach Christ and preach Him crucified, that He is the Son of God and the only way to heaven, we are unique. Make no mistake about it, we are ostracized from the religious community. We'd be much better off being ecumenical and embracing all other religions than the world would love you. But since you stand up and say that there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, but the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when they draw the line. But that's where we draw the line. Because once you lose that identity, shut the doors, turn this into a bingo parlor, and forget it. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the only reason we're here. When He loses His identity, you lose your identity. And so they wanted a king to be like all the other nations. Samuel wept over that. It grieved him greatly. He went before the Lord. Samuel had a heart. If, you don't, if you've never noticed it or not, uh, folks, tonight here, I'm, I read a scripture that said, the Lord said, Samuel, essentially he said, leave me alone. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. God could not ignore his prophet, just like he cannot ignore you. If you are truly living for God, call out his name, he cannot turn a deaf ear. You know, the, you know the, the, the parable about the woman who wore the judge to death. And he said, if I don't answer this woman, she's going to wear me out. And the judge was a type of the father. And the reason is because he had to hear her. And so when Samuel began to pray and intercede for Israel, God heard him. And God said, Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from reigning over them. Well, that was good enough for him. But when Samuel anointed Saul as the king of Israel, he never lost his love for Saul. And Samuel would cry out and intercede for Saul. He wept over him, prayed over him. When Saul was in a rebellion, and it was obvious that Saul was demon-possessed, Samuel kept praying for him. And God said, Samuel, leave me alone again. He said, leave me alone. I have rejected him. I have rejected him, and I have chosen someone else 
to be the king of Israel. And that's where you pick it up here in 1 Samuel. I want you to go to the house of Jesse. When you get to the house of Jesse, I want you to go talk to Jesse, and he'll bring his sons before you. And from those sons, you are going to anoint the next king of Israel. And this is what happens. And in 1, Kings, in 1 Samuel chapter number 16, and in verse number 13, notice carefully what happens. We're going to jump through the sons quickly to this point, because I want you to see what's happening here. In 1 Samuel chapter number 16 and verse number 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. God said that I took my spirit from Saul, but I will not take it from David. God gave David an anointing that Saul never had. When Samuel anointed Saul as the king of Israel, the Bible says that he poured the oil over his head from a vial. But if you notice when you read the scripture here very carefully, you'll notice that when Samuel anointed uh, David as the king of Israel, he poured the oil out of a horn. You say, what's the difference? A vial is man-made. The horn is God-made. The anointing that went upon Saul was a temporary anointing, a temporal, earthly anointing, because he never could rise to the position of the king. But the anointing that went upon David was a heavenly anointing. Notice carefully, he was anointed in the midst of his brethren. One day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back to his brethren, to the twelve tribes of Israel that are gathered together in Israel, the Holy Land. And when he comes back to the midst of his brethren, it is there that they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. And they're going to mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. And they're going to say to him, where did you get these wounds? And he's going to say to them, in the house of my friends, among my brethren. Joseph is a beautiful type of that. Joseph was sold into slavery, not by Gentiles, but by the Jews. The Jews reject him to this day, right now. The Jew, the Jewish people, for the most part, have rejected David. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater David. They have rejected him, and they reject him based upon the Babylonian Talmud. If you'll come to Sunday school Sunday morning, I'll tell you why. And we'll look at the Talmud in a light that should open it up for you to understand. Because right now we started a new study this past Sunday morning, and we're going to pick it up again this coming Sunday. It's very important to understand... What is the basis of a Jew rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ? Here he is anointed in the midst of his brethren. That's important. Why would Samuel put that in there? Why is that important? Because his brethren need to understand that the Messiah, the Mashiach, comes from the house of David. The Mashiach comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The the Messiah of this world will come from the Jewish people. And the Lord Jesus Christ is a son of David. If you look at Matthew chapter number 1, he's the son of David, the son of Abraham. And David, Abraham was not a king, but David was the king. So he's anointed with oil that comes forth from the horn. The horn represents the strength of Israel. If you saw the brazen altar in the Old Testament, you would see that it had horns, four horns on the corners. And there, if someone wanted grace, if someone wanted mercy from God... They would go up and take hold of the horns of the altar. The horns of the altar were saying, Lord, I'm bowing myself and yielding myself to Thee, and I'm taking hold of Your strength, for I have none. God, be merciful to me. When He took hold of the horns of the altar. And so the horn represents the strength of Israel, and it represents the strength of God. And so the strength of God anoints David as the king of Israel. This anointing is important. Most part of the Baptists today, for those that, I, that I've had any experience with down through the, for, through the years, they put very little emphasis upon the anointing. They just toss that word around like it means nothing. Let me tell you something about the anointing of God. The Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. For a man to stand up and preach God's word, he needs to be called. But that calling does not come from mom and daddy. That calling does not come from his professor at the schoolhouse. That calling does not come from his church. That calling does not come from any earthly authority. That call comes from God. 
And it can't be seen, but it can be known. That call that comes from God is a call to preach God's Word. And when that call comes, an anointing comes with it. For when God calls you, He anoints you. And when He gives you a gift, He does not remove that gift from you. The Bible says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Once given, they're yours. From that day on until you draw your last breath on this earth. And that's what makes Samuel different. That what, that's what makes Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Hosea and Joel and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. That's what made them different. It's the fact that when they stood up before men and said, Thus saith the Lord. They were speaking from the authority of heaven. They didn't meet with men. They didn't seek men's counsel. They couldn't have cared less. When they stood up and spoke, they spoke as it were the oracles of God. Because the anointing of God was upon them. That's why the church is dead today. The church is full of religion. It's full of trained preachers that have no anointing from God. They have no call from God. They have no idea of what it is. To preach from the soul and from the spirit and pour their heart out for God and men because of something that's coming into them that was given to them from on high. The preaching of the word of God is not a job. The man that ministers the scripture is not, is, 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 that's not a job. That's a calling. He may be doing it here, but he may be doing it somewhere else. The calling goes with him wherever he goes. You see what I mean? When I walk into this house tonight, I'm not anointed when I walk through those doors. No, 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 no. I may walk out those doors and never come back into this house again. But that anointing goes with me. Just like it does with any minister that's truly called of God. Oh, that the church today. Oh, that the church today. Oh, man. If they could only understand what they're missing. What they don't have. What they've never had, some of them. They have no idea what it is when that anointing is given to a man of God that's called to preach his word. To teach, minister the word of the living God. So in 1 Samuel, when when, uh, Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, he's going to call out the next king of Israel. Now remember this. When Saul was anointed, his family, he was the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Saul was. The son of Kish, a Benjamite. There's There's nothing back in the book of Genesis. If you go back to Genesis 49 and look at Jacob's prophecies on his deathbed. When Jacob was prophesying, and he was talking, he was talking about all of his sons. He was talking about each one of them, and what their gifts were, and where they would be in Israel, and their land, and their part of what uh, of what God had set them apart for. It wasn't anything about a king. But there was, there was a Messiah, Shiloh would come. But you see, there's no designation given to any one of those tribes as saying you're the kingly tribe. No, sir. When the Lord Jesus showed up, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number seven, that he came from the tribe of Judah. Coming from the tribe of Judah, he didn't come from the tribe of Benjamin. He didn't come for an earthly kingdom. He came to reign forever and ever and ever as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That Melchizedek anointing came upon him when he came into this world. And right now at the right hand of the Father, folks, there is a high priest seated there who is anointed of God. And that anointing flows down to you by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. God gave us the Holy Ghost to give us the anointing. And the Holy Spirit cannot come down until the Lord Jesus Christ ascends back to heaven by His own righteousness, accepted into the presence of God. (laughs) There's two righteousnesses in heaven. (laughs) There's the righteousness of that eternal, absolute, almighty being. Invisible, from everlasting to everlasting, that nothing has ever seen but the Son. And then there is that righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ earned Himself when He was on this earth 2,000 years ago by living a sinless, perfect, obedient life under the Father. He ascended back to heaven on that righteousness. And guess what? The gates of heaven swung open wide. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand. Till I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord God Almighty said to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, sit down at my right hand. Till I make thy enemies thy footstool. And so the righteousness and holiness and the anointing of Christ flows down upon us. When he gave the Holy Ghost, he gave that unction and that anointing to his people. Those that preach. 
And that's where I fall at. I fall at viciously. I mean to tell you right now, there is a wall between me and this crowd that gets up and says anybody can preach. Just go to school and learn and study the Bible and get your degree. And you can get it. Yeah, I see what it's done. You? I see what it's done. It's killed the church. It's all mechanics. It's a mechanical dead machine. I worked with machines for decades before I started preaching the Word of God. I know all about machines. And a machine has no soul. It has no spirit. It can't talk back to you. It can't understand anything. It's dead. And that's what's going on in the churches today. They're man-made mannequins. <laughs> How many of you know what a mannequin is? <laughs> man-made mannequins. And they'll be far better off to go get them an honest job and quit trying to preach if you're not called. That's why I don't, you don't hear me. You don't hear me up here in this pulpit. You've never heard me. In 40 years pastoring this church, get up here and try to coerce some young man into preaching the Word of God. That's not my calling. That's his calling. That's not my place. And a lot of young men have come to me and said, Preacher, I believe the Lord's called me to preach. I say, Good. Pray about it. I'll pray with you about it. And sometimes they'll come to me and they'll say, Preacher, what do you think? Do you think, do you think God called me to preach? I say, That's not up to me to tell you if God calls you to preach. I mean, sometimes they're sincere about these things. That's not, you know, I'm not mocking anybody. But, uh, but, but, but the thing is, if you have been called, I'm not worried about it. And you shouldn't worry about it. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. If He's called you, it'll stick with you the rest of your life. And let me be nice and kind to you. You can buy your ticket to Tarshish. You can get on every boat, every plane. You can run. You can chase the sun. But you'll never outrun that calling. <laughs> so I'm not worried about it. If God's called you to preach, you'll have to do something about it. You'll have to do something about it. You really will. I think I was said one time I, that my dad some, was told me that my father, when he got out of the military, World War II, he came home. I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1946. The war ended in, uh, 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 what was it, August in 45, somewhere in there. They, August the 6th, they bombed Hiroshima. And, uh, and then the, and then the uh, uh, war was over with. They bombed Nagasaki about, what, four or five days later. And Japan surrendered, and they signed the peace agreement on the Missouri. Uh, so it wasn't too long after that. So it was over in 45. I was born in 46. And they told me that, that my dad had, had mentioned to the family that he felt like God had called him to preach. He felt like God called him to preach. That's what, he, that's what, I, that's what they told me. And my dad died when I was 10 years old in 1956. And I think he was probably, when he passed away, he was probably, uh, 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 he was probably uh, in his 20s, his late 20s. That's it. That's all he lived. He ran from God. He never... Never announced, he, never, he, never, uh, he never yielded to the call of God in his life. And he left this world quickly. He left this world. And you know, a lot of times, and I've seen this, some men run so hard and fight so hard against the calling of God that they just about destroy it. They can't live it. They can't live with it. I mean, it's just a burden you can't carry. I fought it uh, for a while, but I'm not good at it. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I knew when God, I knew it just like I knew when I was saved. I knew it just like I knew when I was convicted. When God convicted me and saved me, I had no idea to preach. I had a man tell me one time, he said, I knew when God saved me, I was going to have to preach. Well, I didn't. <laughs> when God saved me, that was step one. And I was shouting and rejoicing and praising God because my sins were gone. Hallelujah, you wouldn't believe how I was jumping up and down shouting praising God. I mean, a, the, lo, the weight of the world was lifted off my soul. It was. The weight of the world was lifted off my soul. <laughs> And then I'd sit down there at Third Creek Baptist Church, and I'd sit down there at that pew, and I'd look up there at Bill Cardwell preaching. Bill Cardwell was a good preacher. He'd open up the Bible and start preaching, and something started coming on me, and said, Son, that's where you need to be. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm going insane. <laughs> I'm losing it. What in the world? What's talking to me? <laughs> this is crazy. Because, man, people, if you had only known where I came from, how I used to live, 
before God saved my soul. If you could get any of those people that knew me back there, back in, back in the 60s, and say, did you know that Charles Lawson's preaching? They'd look at you and say, you're kidding me. <laughs> preaching? <laughs> well, they'd laugh you to scorn. But he wouldn't stop. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He wouldn't stop. The voice wouldn't cease. Wouldn't cease. Wouldn't cease. Who's this for tonight? I have no idea. But it's for somebody. Who's it for? It's for somebody. And I'm not calling you. But I'm telling you what happened to me. I went to Bill Cardle and I said, uh, I said, uh, what happened to you when God called you to preach? <laughs> <laughs> he knew immediately. When you, talk, when you start talking to an old pastor like that, and a young man starts talking to him like that, he knows. He knows. But he did not try to push me into anything. And he was wise in that. He was wise in it. Just like I don't try to push anybody into preaching. I've heard, I've heard people mean well, and they say, you've got such a good voice, you ought to be preaching. Folks, it's a whole lot more than that. That's, that, that, that's you know... Or you, you know, your, mom, your, your dad wasn't a preacher. Your grandfather wasn't a preacher. What do you think you ought to be a preacher for? Stuff like that. Stay out of it, folks. Let God call the young men. Let Him call them. Let Him call them. Let Him call them. And a lot of times they'll wrestle with this. They, they'll wrestle with it. I know they do. I know what I did. I'm telling you, I've been there. I've, I've been there. I've done that. I know all about it. I know what it feels like. And I know what it was like that day that I got up at Basswood Baptist Church with my Bible in my hand and I said, God's called me to preach. Man, I'm telling you, I, I had to swallow. I had a knot in my throat. I, I had broken out in a hives and a cold sweat. I thought I was going to die. I mean, I'm serious. I thought, I thought, what in the world did I just say? What am I doing here? That God's called me to preach. And I've told you what happened that afternoon. I, got my, I locked myself in a room, boy. And I mean, I sweat blood all afternoon. Scared to death. I thought, have I made the biggest mistake of my life? I thought, I'll get up there in front of those people tonight. I'll get up there and I'll open the Bible and read it. And then I'll get up there and I'll get stage fright. And I won't know a thing to say. Scared to death. And that's what I went through. And I think most young men go through the same thing. When they, <laughs> that, that happened to you, brother? <laughs> About the same thing, right? And you were over there in Iraq. You watched your buddies die right in front of you. You were talking about that one that fell on the... Fell on a hand grenade or some kind of an explosive. You were, you were right there when he died, weren't you? But you knew him. You knew what happened to him. Been shot at? You've been shot at? You've been shot at? You've seen, the, you've seen the rounds go into the vehicle? You know what a combat situation is like? You know what it is to see men die around you? In other words, you know what hell on earth is like, don't you? But when you got up to preach that time, it wasn't anything like it, was it? <laughs> never more scared in your life. He could drive right into hell with the bullets flying at him. But when he got up here in this pulpit to preach, he was never more scared in his life. Well, you know why? Because it's spiritual things. It's, it's, it's of God. It's that, it's, that, it's that anointing. It's that call from God. And there's nothing else on this earth like it. And they were dying because of it. Well, he, when he anointed David as the king of Israel... That meant that he was the king of Israel. De Israel never, folks, let me say this again now. Israel never, Israel never had a king like David. He was the only king Israel ever had that could join all the tribes together. Every one of them. He reigned over, a, he reigned over the, the complete house of Israel. And God said something about David and never said about anybody else. He said, I will give him the sure mercies of David. Now, David's son Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines. On the one hand, you'd say that's an awful fleshly type sin. Certainly it was fleshly. But Solomon's sins were spiritual. He destroyed Israel spiritually. David's sins were fleshly. David did not bring child sacrifice into Israel. There is a difference between fleshly sins and spiritual sins. 
There are men today in the pulpit who have compromised the Word of God that are leading their churches into the ecumenical movement, into the lap of the Antichrist. They become part of this great apostasy that's moving across the globe that are the most moral, upstanding, clean-looking men you ever saw in your life. But their sins are spiritual, and you'll die under that kind of sin. And then, of course, you've got the, 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 the preacher that, that gets messed up. They say that, uh, they say that if a lot of good men of God, that the, that, the, that the devil couldn't get them. A lot of good men of God, that the devil couldn't get them. The only way he could get them was to send a Jezebel. Send a Jezebel. And the Jezebel got him. You see what I'm saying? The Jezebel got him. Uh, and uh, he yielded to the flesh. Uh, can a man like that be restored, preacher? Well, what does the Bible say? The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Are you listening to me, brother? <laughs> are you out there somewhere? And that's what's happened to you? The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Come on back. Come on back to Him. Come back to Him. It may be that you're able to minister to people now where other men couldn't minister to them because you've paid the price, you've been bitten, you know what the flesh can do, you know how strong it is, come on back to Him. And folks, if that happens to you, welcome Him back. And ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself also. Amen. And pray for this preacher, this preacher, that that doesn't happen to me. Let that man that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. A whole lot better men than me have fallen into that sin. They've fallen into it. And, and, and a lot of men, weaker men, lesser men, far lesser men, enjoy stomping them down when they're down. Yeah, they do. They enjoy it. That, that's how they pick themselves up by, by walking over you. I hope you're not one of them. I hope you're not one of them. Pray for them and pray that God will bring them back and pray they'll come back and there'll be a place for them in the service to the Lord. There's a place for them. There's a place. There's somewhere they can serve. Father, in Jesus' name, bless your holy word now. And I thank you for this time we have together in your house. Now, I know your word won't return void. I know it will accomplish that which you please and it will prosper in the thing where to you've sent it. And Father, I know your gifts and your callings are without repentance. Once given, you don't call them back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you. Listen.